Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Harold Trincunas. I'm the Deputy Director of the Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford University. I'd like, you, like to welcome all of you uh, to CSAC's weekly research seminar. Um, it's a real privilege uh, 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 today to um, introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Timiyevi Aganaba, uh, from the School for the Future of Innovation and Society at Arizona State University. Uh, her work has focused on uh, space governance throughout her career, um, received her PhD from McGill University, um, but she also has professional experience in the space sector. Um, and we're really looking forward to hearing her talk today about her uh, work on testing the space government, testing the space governance system. Um, we'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Aganaba in just a moment, uh, but uh, to clarify, uh, there'll be a, about 30 minutes uh, of uh, talk uh, by Dr. Aganaba, and then we'll go to questions and answers, which I'll moderate. Please put your questions in the Q&A function of Zoom, and I'll go through and uh, organize those uh, um, when the Q&A period starts. Uh, but without much further ado, Dr. Aganaba, uh, over to you. Thank you so much. It is my pleasure to be here. I've been looking forward to this talk for a really long time. So I'm just gonna share my screen. So space is lawless and it's the wild west. You may have heard some variants of this sentiment, but is that true? Well, not fully. There is an international regime governing outer space, which was developed from the 1960s during the Cold War. The successful launch of the Sputnik satellite by the Soviet Union generated unease in the West, since the technology used was similar to that for ballistic missiles. Within this highly sensitive context, rather than being lawless, it was crucial that efforts were made by the international community to regulate this new frontier to avoid both a buildup of weapons and armed conflict in space. Neither the USSR, the Soviet Union, nor the Americans knew who would dominate in space, so the regime had to be acceptable to both while getting buy-in from the international community. It was a domain dominated by these two actors and other governments. However, over the past 20 years, activity in the space environment has significantly changed and the stakeholders have changed. Space activities are no longer undertaken by a handful of states and competing interests have become more diverse. The previously bipolar geopolitical landscape has essentially become multipolar and some would argue that the global economic and political power may be moving towards emerging spacefaring nations. But the US is increasingly taking a leadership role in governance to regain or retain its stature. Now, these bubbles represent relative spending between countries in space activity. And you can see that the US is still the most significant country in space investment, that big bubble in blue, with over half the global expenditure by the US. The small bubbles, though, are also interesting because they represent the diversity and scope of space programs with countries spending as little as up to $10 million in Malaysia. So while this interest in space is increasing, it is worth understanding how multilateral governance and coordination systems have evolved. The principal international fora for discussing questions related to space affairs are the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, COPUS, the International Telecommunications Union, and the Conference of Disarmament. Of this fora, COPUS is the leading multilateral body for discussing questions of international cooperation. From a membership of 24 states back in 1959, COPUS was set up by the United Nations General Assembly to govern the exploration and use of space for the benefit of all humanity. The committee was tasked with reviewing international cooperation, studying space-related activities that could be undertaken by the United Nations, encouraging space research programs and studying legal problems arising from the exploration of outer space. It now has 95 members as of 2020 and new memberships are pending. The COPUS does its work through two subcommittees, the legal subcommittee and the science and technical subcommittee. And the first half of its existence resulted in significant lawmaking through the legal subcommittee 
with the negotiation of five international treaties, as you see highlighted to the right, and several resolutions. The Outer Space Treaty, adopted in 1967, has been ratified by over 100 countries and is seen as the constitution for outer space. And the other four treaties highlighted build on its provisions. Now, while these instruments have staved away significant international conflict in space, it is not enough to think of just the international treaties any longer, particularly with all these new diverse stakeholders. Space is becoming a place for diversified business, at least based on projections. The issue, however, is that the increased activities in space is testing the existing space governance system and it is necessary to ask what the system should look like as we envision our collective space future. Increasing technical standards and procedures, codes of conduct, rules of the road and guidelines, as well as transparency and confidence building measures, all of which are discussed, formulated and implemented at various international regional forums are taking the place of treaties. National laws and policies play a significant role. Domestically, many agencies have a role in space policy and regulation in the United States. These include the Department of Defense, Commerce, Transportation, Energy, and the State Department, as well as specialized agencies such as NASA and the Federal Communications Commission. The Trump administration established the National Space Council as the main hub for interagency coordination on space policy and expanded its membership to include additional agencies. This reinstatement has served as a useful purpose in improving whole of government consideration of space activities within the executive branch. Congress also has an active interest in space activities and regulation with space focused subcommittees in both chambers of Congress. Space has often been seen as a somewhat nonpartisan issue in Congress with differences between chambers or geographic constituencies often playing more of a role than party affiliation. Article six of the Outer Space Treaty requires the United States to authorize and continuously supervise commercial space activities, ensuring that commercial actors do not violate international law because the United States is itself internationally responsible for any harm that occurs. The current US commercial space regulatory regime is relatively comprehensive in regulating launch communication and remote sensing. However, Certain non-traditional commercial space activities are not directly addressed in the current regulatory landscape and gaps prevent commercial actors from knowing which regulator to approach for permission to undertake advanced pioneering activities on orbit or on a celestial body. In fact, the regulatory gaps and lack of authority have increased the chances of commercial entities launching without a license, violating international principles or creating costs for other operators. In brief, global space governance is the entirety of the agreements and other mechanisms, mandatory and voluntary, in relation to outer space activities or affairs. Stakeholder inter interactions and interrelations serve as inputs into governance, and so the process for their formulation by those stakeholders, compliance monitoring and enforcement, is increasingly a mainstream topic with significant policy and security implement, in implementations. It is increasingly important to see space governance as a system because of the influence each of the components have over the other components, as well as the stakeholders leading to increased utilization of the space environment. But the existing space governance framework has not kept up with the changing space domain. While the core principles enshrined in the Outer Space Treaty and other major space treaties remain relevant, there is a lack of international consensus in how they are interpreted and gaps in implementation, particularly for the new types of space activities that are now emerging. In particularly, there are a lack of agreed upon norms of behavior for how future commercial, civil, and national security activities in space should be conducted to ensure the sustainability of the space domain. Now, these four trends show us how the space governance system is reacting to emerging trends which require solution. Let's start with increased activities. The rhetoric is that space commercialization is something new. However, space has already been commercialized in that the space economy is worth close to $400 billion, primarily through commercial satellite services for broadcasting, 
and satellite ground equipment. However, driven by the rapid commoditization of the underlying technology, easier access to capital, and the spread of a disruptive innovative spirit, private sector space activities are introducing a range of new applications, services, and approaches to space activities. These applications include new direct to consumer and business to business services in remote sensing and communications, new in space activities such as on orbit satellite life extension and servicing and space based manufacturing, novel approaches to space launch such as rocket reusability and dedicated small size launch vehicles, and an interest in space tourism and space resources utilization. According to Bryce, there are over 310 new angel and venture backed space companies and close to 1000 investors in these new st startup activities. But the largest innovation has been seen in small satellites or so called mega constellations. As of September 2020, over 3000 functional satellites orbit Earth and roughly half of these satellites are operated by American agencies, companies, or organizations. US commercial companies currently operate nearly three quarters of the satellites in orbit. But as of August, 2020, 84 countries operate these satellites. Many of these commercial and governmental actors in space are new to the domain and may not be fully aware of existing operational best practices for safe and sustainable space operation. But innovations have come through miniaturization and the emergence of these so-called mega constellation. And the planned sizes of these constellations are significant. As you can see, over the coming years, SpaceX plans has already got licenses for over 12,000 satellites. Competition for radio frequencies, which is the way that these are accessed, is for the most part regulated by the radio regulations adopted and administered through the International Telecommunications Union. And the key issue is how to accommodate future growth, particularly as the demand for terrestrial wireless broadband continues to expand sharply. But one of the most immediate concerns for space security lies with the problem of space debris, which is only set to increase with these mega constellations an expected increase of traffic in space. The scale of the problem is not fully characterized and takes on a political dimension, as you can see by these two graphics based on the very depiction of the scale of the problem by different actors. The United States is currently tracking roughly 25,000 orbits and objects in Earth orbit, most of which are pieces of human generated orbital debris, largely than 10 centimeters in size, each of which could destroy an active satellite in a collision. Statistical modeling indicates that there are as many as 900,000 pieces of orbital debris between one and 10 centimeters in size that are largely untracked, each of which could severely damage an active satellite in a collision. Continued growth in orbital debris population and failure to implement improved spacecraft operational practices could lead to a sharp increase in our ability to sustain the benefits that space systems provide. Advances to address this have been made at the international level, such as the United Nations Space Debris Mitigation Guidelines and the Long-Term Sustainability Guidelines adopted by the COPUS, which constitute an important step towards the mitigation of space debris. But it is contended that as these remain advisory technical standards, to be implemented by states and international organizations on a voluntary basis through their own practices and procedures, they do not establish any legal duty to comply with it and its violation would not generate any international responsibility. So future efforts are now focusing on debris remediation, essentially removing the most problematic pieces of debris. However, the question remains whether a state may actively engage in the removal of another state's space junk without interfering and violating the latter's property rights, particularly as Article 8 of the Outer Space Treaty states that a state party to the treaty on whose registry an object launched is carried shall retain jurisdiction and control over such, such object while in outer space. 
So the second issue, the threat of first come first serve mentality. At least 14 national space agencies have identified in situ resource use as a needed capability for long duration missions, including crewed missions to the moon, Mars and deep space. The Artemis program will be the first such NASA led program. Resources such as ice and water bearing minerals from the lunar South Pole will provide fuel, radiation shielding and life support for surface and orbital operations. The regolith will be mined for construction materials and as a source of hydrogen and oxygen. Many asteroids also contain an abundance of water and minerals that could be used to support space operations. And specialized zones like the peaks of eternal light are also a strategic value for solar power. Now self-interest in securing access to natural resources has been a root cause of almost all terrestrial wars. During the Cold War, the commercial exploitation of natural resources of outer space was beyond the immediate concerns of treaty negotiations. But now that has changed, and one cannot disregard the possibility that future conflict could arise due to the competition for these resources. Now, this is a particular concern as the US races with China. Foster and Namrata warn that state behavior in other areas beyond national jurisdiction are a cause for concern and show us what could happen if states continue with a first come first serve mentality rather than seeing space as a global commons for humanity. After President Xi Jinping came to power in 2013, China was engaged in visible demonstrations of its power by asserting its stake on disputed territories to include the South China Sea Islands, disputed territories with India and Bhutan, as well as the East China Seas. Significantly, while China asserts that it will share its space technology with other countries, framing outer space as a global common and abide with international and bilateral agreements, China's past behavior of staking claims to territory based on first presence and historical revisions to include the South China Sea Islands, Tibet and Taiwan offers us little assurance that it will follow through on its commitments to recognize other stakes on shared territory in outer space to include the moon, especially if those areas are rich with resources. And China's behavior in Antarctica could offer valuable insight on how it might behave in outer space once it establishes a presence, for instance, on the lunar surface. But despite this analysis, it is worth cautioning a doomsday approach to China's space ambitions and lunar plans, often to the detriment of redirecting attention away from more pressing threats. The US action of isolating China from bilateral existing multilateral cooperative efforts in space has itself pushed China to launch its own space capabilities. Furthermore, this forced separation has allowed China to use its space program to create its own relationships with countries the United States has long ignored, particularly in Latin America and Africa. And this has resulted in soft power advantages for China that have shown benefits in trade and diplomatic relations. To preclude this, the US seeks to promote the rule of law and have significant say over the rules and laws that govern the exploration and maintenance of the global commons. But there is need to be careful not to not also engender this first come first serve mentality through other means. Now the 1979 Moon Agreement is the fifth and last international space law instrument adopted in 1979. It was specifically negotiated and adopted to set out principles and rules governing mankind's exploration and exploitation of the moon and other celestial bodies. Unfortunately, the moon agreement has not had as much success within the international community. So far, it has been only ratified by 18 states and signed by another four states and none of these are major spacefaring nations. The controversy is that Article 11 of the Moon Agreement provides that the Moon and in its natural resources shall be the common heritage of mankind. This common heritage of mankind concept 
and in particular, the lack of a clear definition of what it entails and the fact that it might lead to mandatory benefit sharing is perceived by many to be the most significant obstacle towards achieving widespread support for the Moon Agreement within the international community. However, according to Jaku and Wampong, there are clear advantages to ratification of the Moon Agreement. For instance, Article 6.2 of the Moon Agreement specifically entitles state parties to collect and remove from the Moon and other celestial bodies, mineral and other substances to use them in support of their exploratory missions. And Article 3.4 of the Moon Agreement expressly prohibits the establishment of military bases on the Moon and other celestial bodies. More importantly, Article 3.2 declares that any threat or use of force or any other hostile act or threat of hostile act on the moon is illegal. Such threat or act cannot be committed in relation to the Earth, the moon, spacecraft, the personnel of spacecraft, or man-made space object, including those on the moon or other celestial bodies. Such an unequivocal prohibition of threat or use of force on the moon and other celestial bodies is not found in the Outer Space Treaty. For now, most relevant is Article 11.5, which calls for state parties to the agreement to establish an international regime, including appropriate procedures to govern the exploitation of the natural resources of the moon as soon as such exploitation is about to become feasible. As a result of the current disdain for this treaty, though, at the international level, we are seeing a shift towards nationally determined governance of international spaces, which Brian Israel characterizes as Space Law 2.0. The question is, is there a real struggle between pragmatic efforts of various states advocating on behalf of their self-interest versus international cooperation? The US certainly seems to be leading the charge on this, particularly with respect to space resources. In fact, the US is taking an expansive approach using multiple instruments to ensure that the US is very clear about their interpretation of international law and they're working hard to sell that vision to the international community through governance instruments and processes at the level of Congress, the president and NASA. Firstly, the US adopted in 2015 the Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act, which includes Title IV on space resource exploration and utilization. This title containing provisions that recognize the property rights of US citizens in space resource derived from celestial bodies. In fact, Section 402 states that a United States citizen engaged in commercial recovery of an asteroid resource or a space resource shall be entitled to any asteroid resource or space resource entailed, obtained, including to possess, own, transport, use, and sell the asteroid resource or space resource obtained in accordance with applicable law, including the international obligations of the United States. For the first time, this act makes provision for private property rights and space natural resources. While some applaud this legislative action designed to stimulate exploration and exploitation of space natural resources, others believe that the act is contrary to the provisions of Article 2 of the Outer Space Treaty, which states that outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, is not subject to national appropriation by claim of sovereignty, by means of occupation, or by any other means. However, the term national appropriation is not defined in the Outer Space Treaty, making it possible to argue that the extraction and even the sale of space resources is not prohibited and therefore already permitted. To diffuse the criticism of possible appropriation by the United States, the Act contains a disclaimer to the effect that by the enactment of this Act, the United States does not thereby assert sovereignty or sovereign or exclusive rights or jurisdiction over or the ownership of any celestial bodies. It remains to be seen if such renunciation will be sufficient to satisfy those who believe that this US legislation in fact constitutes an appropriation of celestial bodies, whether the act is legal at all, and second, whether any additional authorization will be necessary at the international level 
depends on the willingness of the international community to accept the US interpretation of space law as plausible. The 2016 session of COPUS witnessed a negative reaction to the act, but there is a slow emerging trend towards this interpretation as evidenced by Luxembourg, the United Arab Emirates and Japan enacting similar laws. On the 6th of April, 2020, President Trump issued an executive order on encouraging international support for the recovery and use of space resources, which cites Title IV of the US Space Launch Competitiveness Act as the authoritative basis for the executive order. But it goes even further. The key points are that the US supports the right for commercial recovery and use of space resources, that the US is not a party to the moon agreement and rejects the moon agreement as a basis for any space resource governance regime. The US rejects the notion that the moon agreement is reflective of or expresses customary international law. The US repudiates the notion that space is a global commons and the US will seek international support for the exploitation and use of space resources. So the executive order largely restates existing US policy and law, but goes further and is significant that a debatable legal position was clarified in an executive order. The executive order also directed the State Department to lead interagency efforts to encourage other countries to adopt the American position that both public and private organizations have a right to use space resources. The order called for doing so through a series of bilateral or multilateral agreements. The Artemis Accords was therefore proposed as a series of bilateral agreements between the United States and other countries that want to cooperate on the US Artemis program, which is NASA's lunar program to send the next man and the first woman to the moon by 2024. The MOUs, which now have been signed by nine states, sets a normative framework based on the Outer Space Treaty that covers all kinds of activities involved with lunar exploration. But the rights and duties expressed therein are in the form of expectations rather than legally enforceable provisions. While this begs the question if the action waters down existing binding legal provisions through a treaty, it can be negotiated as a lead up to contractual agreements. Section 10.2 of the Artemis Accord sets forth that the signatories emphasize that the extraction and utilization of space resources, including any recovery from the surface of the moon, Mars, comets, or asteroids, should be executed in a manner that complies with the Outer Space Treaty and in support of safe and sustainable space activities. The signatories affirm that the extraction of space resources does not inherently constitute national appropriation under Article 2 of the Outer Space Treaty and the contracts and other legal instruments relating to space resources should be consistent with that treaty. It goes further to say that section 10.4 sets forth that the signatories intend to use their experience under the accords to contribute to multilateral efforts to further develop international practices and rules applicable to the extraction and utilization of space resources, including through ongoing efforts to cope with. So significant efforts are expended to ensure that US-led governance instruments are not seen as replacing international instruments. But the latest innovation has come in contracting, which has the effect of norm setting through private sector activity. In September 2020, NASA announced that it would buy lunar regolith obtained by commercial landers as a token purchase that is on the order of $25,000 for a few hundred grams, intended to set a legal precedent. Companies, which can be international, selected for these space resource contracts will collect a small amount of lunar regolith from any location on the moon's surface and provide imagery to NASA of the collected material along with data that identifies the collection location. After NASA receives the information, the company will conduct an in-place transfer of ownership of the lunar regolith to the agency, completing the commercial transaction. 80% of the payment will be made on delivery. Now, while it's a nominal, nominal amount, the transfer of ownership and selling something collected on the moon 
is the precedent that NASA is trying to set and to determine that such in-orbit transaction does not amount to appropriation. NASA will hold a media teleconference tomorrow, December 3rd at 1 p.m. Eastern, see the link, to announce the companies that are selected to collect these lunar resources as part of the Artemis program. Now, the main challenge to these initiatives is aptly expressed in a recent article published in Science by Boley and Byers, who argue that promoting national regulation of space mining rather than multilateral governance risks a race to the bottom. Because acquiescence is often treated as consent in international law, even NASA's purchase of regolith would, if not protested by other nations, strengthen the US interpretation. NASA's action, they argue, should be seen for what it is, a concerted strategic effort to redirect International Space Corporation in favor of short-term US commercial interests with little regard for the risks involved. While COPUS next year will reopen the discussion on space resources, considering the challenges already mentioned with the forum, this research duo led an effort in August this year endorsed by more than 140 scientists former politicians and diplomats asking the United Nations to take the lead on drafting an international treaty that would set uniform rules. They drafted a letter to the United Nations General Assembly president asking him to seek resolution that would initiate multilateral negotiations. The argument is that a multilateral agreement rather than national instruments would seek to minimize international conflict over the coming race for space resources. Now, moving on to the third issue, increased militarization with a threat of overt weaponization in space. Space technologies play an important role in both national and international security. The military use of space includes spacecraft designed to support terrestrial military and intelligence operations, such as global PNT systems, communications, intelligence, reconnaissance, and surveillance satellites. As more countries integrate space into their national military capabilities and rely on space-based information for national security, there is an increased chance that any interference, either actual or perceived, with satellites could spark or escalate tensions and conflict in space or on Earth. This is made more difficult by the challenge of determining the exact cause of satellite malfunction. Several countries are developing or have developed a range of counter space capabilities, including ground and space based object that could be used to deceive, disrupt, deny, degrade, or destroy elements of space systems. So according to the US national security strategy, space is congested, contested, and competitive, with space now being recognized as a war fighting domain. After the fall of the Soviet Union, the United States saw space as a potential sanctuary free from serious hostile threats and optimized space capabilities for performance. But the days of characterizing space as a sanctuary appear to be over. Despite the environmental risks to the space environment, as was seen by the catastrophic debris creating Chinese anti-satellite tests in 2007, states are still developing this capacity to test what could be classed as weapons, and international law has not damped down these efforts. In fact, there are no consequences. The Outer Space Treaty prohibits the deployment only of nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction in orbits, but there is no mention of conventional weapons, and consequently, these weapons and anti-satellite tests are not prohibited. The United Nations General Assembly established a group of governmental experts to study potential transparency and confidence building measures. The European Union proposed an international code of conduct to address this issue. And coincidentally, China and Russia propose a legal approach through the draft treaty on prevention of the placement of weapons in outer space and the threat or use of force against space objects. But none of these initiatives have limited overt weaponization. Although the aims of the Russian and Chinese treaty are laudable, as is the format of a legally binding treaty, and it confronts the daunting task of defining a space weapon, 
it excludes terrestrially based weapons designed to put space infrastructure at risk, despite that such weapons are far more present threat than space-based weapons. The United States has opposed these proposals, but has not offered any alternatives of its own, despite support for arms control in space being a standard part of nearly every US national space policy since the 1950s. The Department of Defense has talked about developing norms of behavior for space activities from 2010, but to date has made little progress in doing so. And major reasons include the classification and secrecy of national security space activities and concerns about placing limitations on future US actions in space. But the latest risky behavior in July this year from Russian inspector satellite Cosmos 254 caused concern and protest following the release of a high velocity space object believed to be a missile projectile from the satellite. The test would not have needed to strike anything to be a technical success. Data on targeting, deployment, and engine performance would have been enough to advance the technology. According to the Center for Strategic and International Studies, it could have also been intended as a diplomatic message as the test was performed just before talks between the US and Russia on space security. Now as highlighted by CSAC postdoc fellow Stephen Bueno, the possible development of Earth and space-based weapons aimed at satellite and missiles began even before the Outer Space Treaty went into effect in 1967. But few, had, few states had such capabilities and the reliance on space was not what it is today. A significant advantage for military forces on Earth may be denied by taking away the space-based ears, eyes, and means of near instantaneous communication across the globe, including positioning, timing, and navigation capabilities, and an attack on these systems could have unintended consequences with regard to the provision of electrical power systems, severe storm, storm warnings, and space supply. Now in the gray zone, the harmful interference to satellites and high altitude platform signals, and in some cases intentional jamming from hostile actors towards satellite systems is also not adequately addressed by the international governance regime. In cases where a member state of the International Telecommunication Union is responsible for the jamming activity, it is clearly an unresolved political issue because it is left to the member state to find the offending party and to attempt to stop it from creating the intentional interference. The international telecommunication does not have the authority to impose any punitive action. The question is, is there a need to consider new methods and processes to cope with the issue of interference, such as for the international telecommunications to obtain independent monitoring, monitoring stations that have the capacity to detect this problem with unintended and inter intended interference, or give the international telecommunication greater authority to seek the resolution of such problems. The oversight of this operation and the selection of which, which administrations would perform this service is clearly a matter of some sensitivity. So this body does not appear to be an appropriate place to address this problem. Hence, these increased threats has led to the establishment of the Space Force in the United States as a separate service under the Air Force. While the United States President Donald Trump is credited with getting the Space Force off the ground, particularly as his calling for it came for a surprise, it has been touted for decades. The Space Force is now one year old, having spent the year working on its organizational chart and looking for independence next year. In the 2021 budget, the United States Air Force transferred $15.4 billion from existing accounts to the Space Force. And you can see the breakdown on what that $15 billion will be spent. 10 billion will be on space research, development, testing and evaluation of technologies and weapon systems. 2.4 billion for the procurement of satellites and launch services. 2.6 billion for space operations and maintenance and approximately 100 million for war related satellite services and space operations. Now, according to the Secure World Foundation, the creation of the United Space, Space, Space Force by itself does not address 
or fix any of the major underlying challenges that drove the original debate. The biggest unresolved policy gap is how to fix the way the military acquires new space capabilities. The second major policy challenge is defining the future mission of the Space Force and how much it will focus on in-space activities versus supporting terrestrial military activities. Some Space Force proponents believe that the focus should change from supporting terrestrial operations to activities in space, such as attacking or defending satellites and providing security for commercial mining and other speculative activities. There is also a debate over whether the Space Force should put more emphasis on new destructive offensive counter space capabilities. While it released its first doctrine document in August, according to the Space Secure World Foundation, there is still a need to develop a national consensus on space deterrence doctrine. Though it is posited to be in response to adversaries, particularly Russian and Chinese space forces, the US action of developing a space force has inspired space forces across the world, which Jakku and Pelton argue put the space governance system at greater risk. It is apt to ask how the international law of war plays a role in keeping those military users in check. As military entities are increasing their use of and reliance on commercial satellites, and this dual use and hosted payloads complicates the traditional divide between military, civilian, government, humanitarian, and private commercial ventures. And so in this case, what is a legal military target? And how do the international laws of war apply to these assets? Attacks on legitimate military objects versus civilian objects are well regulated in the context of armed conflicts on Earth. So this could be a deliberate strategic decision using integration as a shield, yet actively deceiving an adversary that there is no military use of a civilian object and using such facilities as a cover for hostile activities could be considered a violation of the laws of war. There is therefore a need to reach a consensus on additional legal regulation directly applicable to the conduct of armed conflict that may involve the use of space technology. University consortiums, particularly the McGill, Milamos and Woolmerone manuals seek to codify the international law applicable to the law for military uses of space. In the end, although the laws of war may in theory appear to apply to activities in outer space, the principles may not be specific enough to provide appropriate regulation for the increasing diverse ways in which outer space could be used during the course of armed conflict. Finally, the last point, the need to encourage responsible behavior in space. While we seek to encourage responsible behavior, likely discouraging irresponsible behavior in space that threatens space security is still important and involves clarifying the legal framework and gaining consensus as to its adaptation. But a significant cause of tension is the lack of clarity regarding the intent of actors. So could we start with initiatives towards increased transparency? Without proper information about the capabilities, preparedness, interests, and strategies of one another's states, states are prone to strategic miscalculation, especially as relations between states are characterized by information asymmetry. The UK in 2020 are taking a new approach and have tabled a resolution at the United Nations General Assembly, launching a new discussion on reducing space threats through responsible behaviors, proposing an open, inclusive, bottom-up approach to identifying responsible behavior in outer space that would contribute to a lessening of tensions and a reduction of incentives for arms racing. However, the strategic challenges in the space domain will remain if there are no consequences for irresponsible behavior in outer space. Consequences for such behavior by a non-state actor such as a commercial entity can be imposed at the national level through the legal processes for breaches of the domestic regulatory framework, 
and by policy decisions for a broader range of behavior, bearing states that act as flags of convenience. But where a breach is committed by a state itself or with tacit support of the state, there are limited means to impose consequences on the states, and this is a flaw of the space government system. So in conclusion, as aptly put by Professor Sadie Peckenham, as space law is embedded in both international and national systems, it remains a supreme challenge to design global space governance to include the formal and informal laws, institutions, processes, and practices that structure relations, stabilize expectations, guide and restrain behavior, and frame policy responses for stakeholders. The historical progress to develop the legal regime in space is balanced by the fact that viewed as a whole, even if the UN bodies have been successful at maintaining a certain overview of space activities, they have become less effective in recent decades with respect to the progressive development of law, mainly due to political gridlocking, the requirement for consensus and decision-making, and the variety of interests competing for priority on their agenda. But the interesting aspect of space governance is that it is dynamic and ready for inputs from other global governance issue areas to frame our collective space future. Thank you. You're on mute. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Aganaba. Um, uh, wonderful talk. We'll go straight to Q&A now, uh, and we have quite a few questions. We'll see how many we can get through. Uh, as per our usual custom, I'll start with a couple questions from our CSAC uh, pre- and postdoctoral fellows uh, before going to the general list. Um, Lindsay Hundley, uh, one of our postdocs, asks, uh, thanks for a super interesting talk. In your presentation, you highlight a lot of drawbacks of the bottom-up approach to building a space governance system. That is through hodgepodge bilateral and multilateral treaties like contradictory laws, uh, potential to prioritize short-term interests over long-term interests, et cetera. But I'm wondering whether you see an advantage from this kind of bottom-up approach. Alternatively, do you see drawbacks to a more top-down approach for developing space governance? So, I mean, historically, when we had fewer space actors, the top-down approach really worked. And now we're seeing with the diversity of actors, um, even though the top-down approach should work because we have more and more actors, their interest is so diversified that it seems to be each country wants to do its own thing. And the US is really leading the way in, in, in you know, using that bottom-up approach. And it's, it's received a lot of conflict from the international community because they believe that this is going to be a race to the bottom. If you, we're gonna ha start having flags of convenience, that means we're gonna have states that have lower standards. And as we have all these issues that I raised, such as space debris, um, the, the threat of collisions, et cetera. If we have these flags of convenience and we have this race to the bottom, you know, this is gonna harm everyone and the space environment is not gonna be sustainable. So the debate really now is, should we be going back to developing an international, global, uh, multilateral approach, bearing in mind that we have so many actors now that opening up the Outer Space Treaty, for instance, to address some of its issues may be close to impossible. But I think maybe that is not um, only in the space domain. This is international governance generally, right? With the issues of trying to negotiate international treaties. It's just so challenging. And I mean, the UN long-term sustainability guidelines took nine years to negotiate and that's a non-binding guideline. So what, how long would it take to negotiate a multilateral treaty? Thank you. Um... Stephen Bono asks, um, one of our CSAC uh, postdocs, um, for those countries who believe extraterrestrial resources to be the common heritage of mankind, what recourse do they have to combat the first come first serve approach to space embodied in the Artemis Accords? The Moon Treaty seems to have no teeth. So um, Stephen, I've read your work. It's very, very impressive, particularly um, your comments in, in the Hill about the Artemis Accords. The, the interesting question is, some people say that the Moon Treaty, because it only has 18 signatories, is a dead treaty, is a failed treaty. But the Moon Treaty is talking about establishing an international regime when space exploitation is about to become feasible. That means up to date, space, space exploitation was not feasible. So it didn't even have an opportunity to be useful. So those proponents of the Moon Agreement 
actually should continue making the case for why their agreement, why we should have an international uh, uh, meeting to talk about what kind of regime we want. And I think what we what what people are not clear about is Article um, 18 and, and, and Article 11.5 of the Moon Agreement says that the term common heritage of mankind should find its meaning from that treaty. That means all the other ideas we have about common heritage of mankind and what they mean shouldn't apply in the space context. It is within the context of the space regime that we should determine what common heritage of mankind means. And if the international community who are so worried, for instance, about benefit sharing um, of resources, if they decide that they don't want that, then they can determine that in this new regime. But the issue is just that should let's just have the conversation and let's just determine should, what this regime should look like. And the funny thing for me is that on earth with any kind of natural resource that you want to exploit, you have to pay royalties. Why is it that in the space context, you know, actors are so gun ho that they shouldn't have to share any of the benefits. It seems to me that you're just trying to look to, to shirk responsibilities when on earth you would never have to do that. Thank you. Um, let's go now to a question from um, uh, Professor Gabrielle Hecht. Uh, she's the Stanford History Department and also a senior fellow here at CSAC. She says, uh, thanks for a wonderful talk. You raised so many important issues and I greatly value your innovative take. I am particularly interested in two things, orbital debris and the treatment of celestial bodies as private resources available for extraction. The first round of scholarship on space made much of the imperial rhetoric around space, starting with the final frontier. You've shown us how over time this rhetoric has translated into very directly into a range of imperial practices. The push for extraction, including the treatment of those resources as cheap nature, first come first serve mode, the wanton, the wanton abandonment of waste, and the frankly bizarre twist in how the commons are defined and addressed. How do you see these parallels and how are imperial dynamics at play or not in the relationship and treaty negotiations between large and small space nations? Yeah, so that's very interesting. Um, I mean, if we, if, we, if we talk about the moon, for instance, almost all countries, in fact, everyone seems to have a relationship to the moon, like from a cultural perspective. And we, we have this whole idea of if we're going to become a space-faring nation, I mean, space-traveling space species uh, in, in multi-planetary societies, we have to be able to exploit the resources in space to be able to move around within the solar system. And the reason that we need to do that is because we cannot carry resources from Earth because that's the launch cost of carrying you know, your oxygen, your water, all those things are prohibitive. But if we utilize the resources in space, then we actually have the ability to create an in-space economy. And so you have the people who are arguing that should stay, space stay pristine, um, et cetera, versus this increased utilization of the space environment and the space society, um, community. But it seems to me that the majority of actors um, seem to want more activities in space. And for that to happen, it's going to have to come with exploitation. But maybe we need to take an adaptive governance approach, looking at sustainability principles, looking at the environmental movement on Earth to ensure that we don't have a wanton destruction of the space environment just because we want to utilize those resources. And that is why I'm arguing that international space law as it stands is not adequately addressing the risks that we know these first come first serve actors will take if there is nothing to constrain their behavior and their actions in space. Now the kind of capitalist American philosophy is very much let's wait till the activities start before we regulate the whole idea that law stifles innovation, but we need to balance that because we know we can look at history to see what innovators do. And we know that if we let innovators loose, you know, they will do whatever they like. So, so you raise some really great point and we can see that with orbital debris, even though there was no rules limiting orbital debris, as soon as we set guidelines, we still see actors not following those guidelines because it's not legally binding. So the question becomes, how do we create legally binding regimes and will they be accepted? It seems that the trend is, to, is, is, towards, is not towards that. So the focus is on how do we create norms and how do we guide responsible behavior in space? 
this is the debate as to what is the mechanism in which to you to, to be able to do that. Great, thank you. Um, from David Elliott, one of our CSAC affiliates, um, he asks, uh, for many years, Russia and China have wanted to reach an international agreement that restricts the militarization of space, which would preclude, for example, the placing of weapons in space that would attack targets on Earth or targets that are in space or transiting space. The US has not been receptive to this, in particular because of our interest in developing ballistic missile defenses that include elements stationed in space. What is the current status of this question? So it's, it's very, the, the issue with this is at the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva, this is where these, th this treaty by Russia and China has been tabled. And the issue has been that this, this body is deadlocked for various strategic reasons. And the US is completely against this treaty by Russia and China, because I believe that they don't really believe that it's um, in, done in good faith. And the reason is because they've tried to define space weapons in their treaty to not actually affect the most serious type of weapons that could exist, the ones from, from Earth to space. And, and so their treaty would allow the more threatening weapons. And so I think the, the but the US is, it has shown a little bit of bad faith in itself too, because it refuses to bring any proposals to the table as to an alternative. So it's a deadlock decision, basically, even though many of the other countries would welcome some kind of agreement. Um, maybe not the Russian Chi Chinese treaty, because Russia and China themselves continue to, you know, have threatening behavior, even though they have established this treaty. Um, so what should the alternative be? The UK have put in, like I said, a resolution to, to have a, a bottom-up approach to talk about norms because it seems that the treaty-based mechanism is not being, is not, is not um, working. Thank you. Um, so we're uh, running short of time, so I'm gonna skip, and I'm gonna try to squeeze two more questions in. Um, from Alan uh, Weiner at uh, Stanford Law School, he says, thank you very much for the interesting presentation. With respect to the exploitation of natural resources in space, what lessons about space governance can be drawn from international efforts to regulate other commons, namely the law of the sea? Could one imagine a regime comparable to the deep seabed regime, for example? Yes. So we have to be careful about an anal analogizing space, even though we should look at the deep seabed, we should look at Antarctica and these other areas beyond national jurisdiction. The thing is, the challenge that we have with the deep seabed is this notion that the US rejects of the common heritage of mankind, being that these resources belong to everyone, so there should be a global allocation. And so what you have in the deep seabed regime is you have an authority, the deep seabed authority, which regulates and which coordinates this distribution of benefits. This is the thing that we don't have in space. The question is, do we need an authority? Do we need an international institution that would actually be able to govern and allocate in the same way that you have in the deep seabed? This is something that I think the US would categorically refuse and reject, but it is something that seems to me is going to, we need to think more about it for the future. Okay, um, and I think I'll have to make this the last question, unfortunately, although we have quite a few more. You, excellent talk, raised so many uh, interesting issues. Um, Damon Sheet says, great presentation. How do you foresee the push-pull relationship, relationships between corporate-based and state-based space programs in light of trends of cooperation uh, uh, with regards to who has the most power? Um, who has the most power to drive legislation that is universally accepted and hopefully abided by those who have an interest at stake? Yes, that is a really interesting question. And it depends on the country. And I mean, when we look at the US, we see that commercial actors are driving many of the initiatives. So for instance, the 2015 um, Space Launch Competitiveness Act, which, which talked about the space resources, was driven by lobbying coming from industry, particularly some companies, deep, deep space industries um, that were established that wanted to have this activity. And so it's interesting because the competition or the race is between private actors in the established countries and then, you know, small countries. Some have even said it's between developing countries and the big private actors. You know, the Amazons of the world, the SpaceX X's of the world, 
it, it's almost like they're acting on behalf of the state though, because they, they've been given so much support. SpaceX would never have happened without the COTS program from NASA, where billions of do millions of dollars was basically put into SpaceX de developing that capability. So I think there's definitely a balance in that it's definitely um, the, 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 the private actors have a lot of power and, but they have to be curtailed because the reg regulatory system has not kept up to date with these actors. So more efforts need to be made to, to keep these actors in check. Well, unfortunately, I think that's all the time we have. Um, but thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Aganaba, for a really fascinating talk and for joining us this week uh, um, at the CSEC Research Seminar. Right? We really appreciate you taking the time to do so. And again, just, just a fascinating topic. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. And I hope you can send me all the Q&As that were given because I would love to be able to follow up with that. I'll definitely uh, copy those down and email you the questions um, so that uh, uh, you can have them for your, your records. Perfect. Thank you so much.